the Redeemer of all men. I call him Jesus, for he's my dearest friend. If you feel no one can help you, and your life is out of hand, I know a man who can. I can't walk upon these waters or calm the troubled sea, but I know a man who can. I can't cause blind eyes to open or make the lame to walk again, but I know a man who can. Some call him Savior, the Redeemer of all men. I call him Jesus, for he's my dearest friend. If you feel no one can help you, and your life is out of hand, I know a man who can. Yes, I know a man who can. Way to go, Bill. All right. Super. We, we've had more fun with the, the lightning storms we've had with our computers and their, all this kind of stuff. That's great. We're on fire. There we go. All right. Would you turn with me, please, the book of Luke, chapter 16. We're looking at uh, some of the parables of Jesus under the umbrella of the title of discipleship. In other words, growing in Christ, growing to become what Jesus would have us to be, learning the lessons that he taught. And in Luke 16 and the first nine verses, he is referring to Jesus, also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a, ma who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I, I am not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So... Summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, Well, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager of his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Would you read with me, please? And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. If you're like me, this is perhaps one of the more difficult parables to interpret, to understand, all right, why, why did Jesus share this story? And why was it written into the gospel accounts? Did Jesus actually commend the embezzler? 
the, the servant who had defrauded his master by having these people write down their accounts? Well, the answer is yes, Jesus actually did. Now be careful here, otherwise you might make an incorrect uh, application. Jesus' commendation was not for the character of the embezzler, but it was rather it was for his astuteness, his shrewdness, his knowing what was about to happen and taking action with it. Jesus didn't waste his time, and Jesus didn't waste his words. What is it that Jesus is wanting us to learn from this application? So let's take a real careful look at this Luke 16 passage again. Now, we may not be familiar with the principle set up, since very few of us have sufficient wealth that we can hire someone to manage all of our various business enterprises. That was not uncommon and isn't uncommon today in many places in, in, around the world. But especially now in the context of what we're hearing from the scriptures, it was very common in those days, and there are biblical precedents that go beyond it, where a, a man would hire a, a manager, a, a steward, according to one translation, who would oversee his property, his employees, his business enterprises, and all of this. For instance, in the Old Testament, one of the examples that ought to come to you is, the, is Joseph. When he was sold into slavery, uh, Potiphar, who was a man of wealth and position within the Egyptian economy and society and as a military officer, high-grade officer, he, uh, he, he bought Joseph and as Joseph began working for him, he began to see in Joseph integrity and positive character, and things just were working better. His employees were getting along better, and his wealth was increasing. Joseph was an example of a good steward who managed his bosses or his employers' goods, and they all prospered. In this case, in Genesis chapter 39, verse 4, Joseph found grace in his sight, referring to Potiphar's sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. Now, this is what was going on now in this parable that Jesus is talking about. A rich master would just trust, he had learned to put trust in this person, and it would usually require somebody to come to him and say, do you know that your manager is, is embezzling? He's taking some of your money. He's doing things improperly. That would cause alarm bells to go off, and he would go back now to his manager and say, okay, I need an accounting. Let's open the books. Let's see how we are doing. Now, the steward here in this parable of Jesus, he faced the facts. He, he knew he had been doing wrong. He knew he had been taking that which he was not authorized to take. And so he knew his job was about to come to an end. So when he ordered to get his accounts in shape, he knew the verdict would be guilty because he was what? Guilty, right. He also knew that he had not developed his physical ability, to be, so he wasn't going to be strong enough to do the hard manual labor, which was typical for some people to be able to do. He also was a man of some prestige in the community, and he said, I, I, I just can't bring myself to go beg. And so what could he do? And so he used some shrewd thinking and went to his master's debtors and allowed them to lower the amounts of what they owed, assuming that they in kind would later treat him kindly and make provision for his welfare. Now, this is a strange commendation. 
The men listening to Jesus tell this story expected to hear that the rich master condemned this wicked servant. And I'd say we would too. How surprised they must have been to hear Jesus say in verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. And here's the application and maybe the challenge for us. This is Jesus continuing on. He says, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Note here that the master commended this unjust steward or manager not because, not for his motive, but for his astuteness, his shrewdness. Not for his fraud, but for his foresight. And I think it's rightly right to assume that the manager was then fired. So what is the meaning, Jesus? What, what, are, you, what are you wanting us to take from this story? Here's the application. If unsaved people for selfish or unworthy purposes can display such shrewdness, such foresight, such dedication to, to worldly goals, how much more should Christians use intelligence and foresight and zeal for kingdom interests? Take, for example, great athletes or great musicians who are famous for their performances in the secular realm. They d d dedicate time and energy to the work to become skilled. We're on the opening phases of the Olympics this year. And I don't know if you've ever been around the Colorado Springs to where they have the training camps. If you've been down by Oklahoma City and driving south on Interstate 35, you see where they're training there with the rowing of the of the boats. In other words, people literally are dedicating their lives to becoming so skilled in their ability to do this sport or that sport, hoping for a prize that can be hung around the neck. Now what they're really hoping for is the advertising that they can sell <laughs> after they win the gold and have it hung around their neck. But in other words, look how they dedicate themselves for something that is strictly of this world. Does the cause of Christ deserve any less devotion? This, I think, is the application here of this parable. Can we justify an inferior dedication to preparing for the worship and service of God? This parable is, is to challenge people. The unjust steward looked ahead. He made provision for the future. And Jesus said in verse 9, he says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. So that when it fails, there's a key we ought to pick up on. For when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. In other words, we're to use the treasure of this life and the skills and the talents that we have. We're to use this treasure in such a manner that when death does come, and it will for all of us, we will have a welcome in heaven. Far too many times we find ourselves looking for the approval of our peers, even in the church, rather than realizing we are living out our life and performing our ministry, doing our teaching of our class, preparing the Lord's Supper, doing the, the music, all those who serve in this tremendous capacity, whether it's playing of instruments or whatever. We have to be careful that we're doing this unto the Lord. Now, we want people to be blessed, and we hope it comes across in such a manner that it's pleasing and beneficial for you. But the bottom line is, when it's all said and done, if, if this is just being done for what good things people say about us, that's going to go away. I, as a pastor, I've performed many, many funerals throughout my years. 
And I've attended also many funerals that I was not actually conducting. It's, a, it's kind of amazing how so many great things are said about the person that is dead. And, and I'm not saying it's even stretched. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm saying the noble things because that seems to be the focus. None of us have lived at that level 100% of the time though, right? I mean, we've done good things and we've, done, we've sacrificed and all this, but the bottom line is there's also shortcomings. But the, except for the immediate family that lost their loved one, it is, it's just a matter of days till pretty soon we have forgotten all the kind expressions that we said. Because we have gone on with life, with its challenges. Who you are and what you do. We need to be looking beyond lying in front of our family and friends at a funeral service. Whether good things are said about us or not, our life, our commitment, our dedication has got to be unto the Lord because He is the one to whom we will go and give an account for our lives. We may have been misunderstood. We may have even had people turn against us. But if our commitment has been unto the Lord, we can still be assured of a warm welcome into the glories of heaven. You see, entrance into heaven depends on your salvation. Are you saved or not? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior or not? That, that's how you determine whether you're going to get into heaven. But listen, the Bible also spends quite a bit of time talking about the rewards in heaven. And as entrance into heaven depends on your salvation, rewards in heaven depend on your faithful service, the faithful way you have served others in Jesus' name. I don't honestly understand everything about heavens, uh, about the rewards in heaven. I mean, maybe you've said like I've said, I've said, well, I'm just going to be excited if I, uh, to get there. But the Bible also talks a great deal about the rewards. And once again, I've learned through the years, when the Bible speaks, though this brain don't get it, there's something there. There is something desirable. So therefore, what I sacrifice, what I give my energy and time and service to help and benefit of other people, that God is aware of this, and there is a blessing coming my way that's even greater than the simple presence of being in heaven. In other words, God is saying, it's worth it. It's worth it. I can't give you all the details. But I just know the Bible does teach about rewards in heaven. And there's an application here for us. So what about us as a Christian? The wisdom for the Christian. What about this? Because that's really what astuteness is all about. It's applying wisdom and where wisdom comes from and how, it use, how we use wisdom in our lives and making our choices and our decisions and our time management and distribution of our assets. Are, are the children of this world really wise for there seems to be an application here that there is something going on. Well, their, their wisdom is only in this generation. There, there is some wisdom being used there. There is some astuteness. There is some insight being used. And some people have really been, you know, amassed tremendous assets as a result. But the bottom line is, if you're not a Christian this morning, anything you are, all that you have, comes to a stop when you take your last breath. I've told Liz one of the Sundays we were down there in the afternoons, and she was having a little bit of a difficulty time, and I said, Liz, 
you've got to understand this. She was beginning to experience a little bit of fear of what's going to happen. I said, Liz, I just know this. When you close your eyes for the last time, you're going to open your eyes to glories you've never even begun to think about. And I can say that with assurance and absolute confidence. And that's true for you. I know sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we feel like I'm just giving and giving and it doesn't seem like anyone else is stepping up to the plate. We're not, we're not doing this. We're not serving one another for what we get out of it. We're doing what we're doing to give honor and glory to the Lord, and I'm going to leave the rewards up to him. But he said he will reward us. And I'm expecting that to be a pretty cool thing. In other words, children of this world, all they have is worldly wisdom. The Bible says they're fools. If they build their house of life on shifting sands. I, I know one of the frustrations of getting out of high school is, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Are you going to go to college? <laughs> well, which one of the 10,000 courses are you going to take? What are you going to major in? Or are you going to go in the military so that you can get the, what we used to call the GI Bill. They've changed the name a little bit. In other words, what, how am I going to live out my life? What kind of a job am I going to have? Am I going to be a profession? Am I going to, uh, do I have access, some land that I can live as a farmer? What am I going to do? Well, most of us who have lived a number of years have already experienced that some of the trades that were absolutely gold mines are no longer gold mines. Some of the professions that meant you were going to be wealthy are not working out that way. Things change. So whenever you enter into college, say, well, I want to major in this, or I want to major in this, or maybe you're going to hire out to uh, a tradesman and learn that trade. Well, that may be an outstanding choice, but will that choice stand over 20 years and 30 years and 40? I don't know. Life changes. Things happen. You see, the truly wise are those who build on the solid rock and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I want his wisdom so that when things change, when stuff happens in the course of life, I can make those adjustments. Some of you have had to do this. That which you've dedicated your life and training toward no longer brings the results that it used to bring, and you've had to seek something else to learn, to do, or maybe in a skill. But you did it in order to be able to provide for your family. But from a Christian perspective, I want to keep my priorities right. In other words, that Jesus is going to be my captain. God is my father and the Holy Spirit is my guide. And no matter what happens, whether our economy as a nation tanks, as some say it will, or whether we prosper, whichever one is promising. Whichever happens, something will be happening. How are we going to deal with it as it develops? If my priority is focused upon the lordship of Jesus Christ, and I'm seeking after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, I can have confidence in tomorrow. I believe that's part of the lesson of this parable. You see, we are right now, we are in earthly tabernacles. We have been, we have received eternal life when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. And I think we understand, and most of us here, if not everybody here, understands that we're on a journey towards 
a heavenly city. There are some scriptures I want to share with you that I think have direct application to this parable that Jesus teaches. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Look, look here now. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Application. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. Let, let no one deceive himself. If, if anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. And then in James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Out of James, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, we begin to conclude now. If any of you, if any of us lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Let's go back up to the first part of this text. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God and ask in faith, believing. God does want you wise. He does want you to have astuteness over business decisions that you have to make, over personal investments that you have to make, over do I do this, do I that? Seek the Lord and His righteousness and let's see what God has in mind because He knows the tomorrow. I don't. He knows What's happening within our society? I just know a little bit. You see, when it's all said and done, we are back to the principle of trusting God with your whole heart and praying to God for His direction and His will for you. You see, what you are about to do, what you think you're going to do, what you, what you believe right now is the right thing to do. It's not my purpose to challenge that. My purpose right now is to encourage you, seek God's will first. Is that what you're about to do? Is that what God wants for you to do? Well, how do I know that? 
Look up in the sky and see what shape the clouds are in? Do, do I cut open a chicken and see what the intestines look like? That's what people still do that today, by the way. When I was a freshman in Bible college, the president of our school, his first night in chapel, he spoke and says, Boys, he was talking to preacher boys. That's, he says, Boys, we're glad you're here. But I'm here to tell you right now, some of you are here because when you were out in the cornfield, you looked up in the sky and you saw the clouds that says GPC. And you concluded that was God telling you to go preach Christ. I'm here to tell you that for some of you that are here today, that probably was God telling you, go plow corn. <laughs> what he was simply saying is, God is the one who calls. A lot of times our hearts are stirred within us that we want to do something and we really intend to do something. We want to do it to God's glory and his honor. Let's just make sure that it's God who's done the prompting and that, that, we're not, that it's not us responding in a moment of feeling good. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Ask him for his wisdom. And you will begin to experience God's blessings and his strength that's going to get you through stuff you have no clue that's coming down your path. But God does. And he's ready right now to equip you to bless you, to strengthen you, to enable you so that you will make wise choices. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, there is no question about the wisest thing you could do this morning would be to put your trust in Him. Have you asked Jesus to save you, to, to forgive you of your sins? Have you asked Jesus to come into your life? That's where we start. And we've got a wonderful road ahead. Would you stand with me, please? Father, I just thank you and praise you for what you're working out. I honor you. And this morning, I don't pretend to understand what everybody's going through, what challenges they're facing. But I do know this. I know that you know. And so once again, Father, I just come and asking you to speak to each one of us so that we can have a, a, an, an understanding of what is your direction, your will, so that we might be wise in our decisions and our choices. And I give you the praise and glory and honor in Jesus' holy name. Amen.